Hello. Uh, today we're going to talk about the International Court of Justice. Most people refer to this court as the World Court. And what I hope we'll do today is to learn something about the International Court of Justice, its operations. We'll examine the role of the court in human rights disputes, and we'll consider the IJ, ICJ role in construing treaties, including human rights treaties. We will review the process of nations submitting to the jurisdiction and the process of withdrawing from the jurisdiction of the court. First of all, this court is located in the Peace Palace, which is located in The Hague. This is a beautiful uh, building. It was built originally to accommodate the uh, earlier version of this court, which was established by the League of Nations. But it has been the uh, site of the International Court of Justice uh, since its establishment in June of 1945. And of course, it came in to being through the Charter of the United Nations. It is the successor to the League of Nations Court, which was ironically called the Permanent Court of International Justice. That court uh, ceased to be permanent uh, sometime in 1939 with the outbreak of World War II. Uh, but it had been established even before the League of Nations, established originally in 1899. Um, as we've said, the court is located in The Hague, the Netherlands. Uh, this beautiful building we'll see something more of uh, as we look at the interior in just a moment. Uh, it has two types of jurisdiction, which we will talk about in just a minute. Contentious jurisdiction, and by contentious, we mean disputes between nations. Individuals don't get to come to this court on their own. It's only nations uh, that can come under the contentious jurisdiction of the court. And then there's advisory jurisdiction, and that's advisory about the meaning of treaties or uh, issues that are brought uh, to the court by the uh, Security Council, the uh, UN General Assembly, or other bodies of the United Nations. It really is the court of the United Nations. It's composed of 15 judges. They're elected for terms of nine years by the United Nations General Assembly and the Security Council. It is served by a registry, uh, which is its administrative arm. Its languages, as we'll see in a minute, are English and French, and advocates before the court may use either of those languages. Um, it, uh, has jurisdiction, again, between nations. I want to keep saying that because I want to make sure that you distinguish this court from the European Court of Human Rights, uh, where you have individuals with the authority to sue their own governments or to bring actions against their own governments. Uh, but that's not true of the International Court of Justice. It is really disputes between nations and the advisory jurisdiction, as we discussed a moment ago. There are 15 judges, but be very careful about this, because, and, and this point is counterintuitive for uh, most American and British law students. For every action that's brought by one nation against another nation, there must be a judge from any nation before the court serving on the court. So if among the 15 judges, uh, there are not judges uh, from these two countries that are involved in a dispute, then the court selects ad hoc judges. Ad hoc judges then uh, representing, or at least appearing as nationals of uh, particular countries will appear, and we'll see shortly that this means that other times, rather than having 15 judges, uh, we'll have 17 or possibly more, depending on the number of parties and the membership of the court at the particular time that the dispute is brought before the court. The registrar is 
we will think of in the United States and the United Kingdom as a clerk of court, but you'll find that the registrar in these international courts is extremely important and it's a very significant post that uh, it is the secretariat also for international commissions and activities relating to judicial and diplomatic as well as administrative tasks. I now would like to show uh, shortly the tape of the, the argument in the case of Cambodia versus Thailand. I want you to notice that there are 17 judges because at the time this dispute was brought, neither Cambodia or Thailand had judges on the court. So it's necessary to add uh, these two ad hoc judges to make 17 judges. Also ask you to uh, observe the fact that the advocates wear the clothes that they would wear in their own nation. So they may be in business suits, if that's the way they appear in court. They may be in robes. British barristers will wear wigs. Uh, there are oral arguments and written submissions. So let's see a little piece of, of this case as they come to court to decide and consider Cambodia versus Thailand. Principles of international law and greater adherence to the international rule of law. Oh, rappel de l'histoire récente. Pourquoi le Cambodge revient 50 ans après l'arrêt du 15 juin 1962 devant La référence au territoire du Cambodge ne peut être comprise qu'au regard de ce que la Cour. The purpose is to ensure that if difficulties ensue. In understanding and giving effect formally pronounced by the court, the court itself, on the application by the party, can be moved which will therefore be the main focus of this part of the argument. Other issues raised by Thailand will be dealt with after that, either by me or by my co-counsel who will follow. A look at uh, those proceedings. Uh, I suspect you're struck by the fact that each of the advocates appears uh, in their own uh, garb, the garb they would wear to courts in their nation. Uh, you also are probably struck by the fact that although this is an argument before a court that we would normally think of as an appellate court, you're not getting questions like you would in a British court or a court in the United States. Uh, it's incredible to, uh, to watch one of these arguments because essentially what the advocates are doing is they're reading their entire oral argument. And they're reading from a text which has been submitted to the court in advance. So uh, there are written memorials, that is briefs, uh, that uh, give some guidance to the court. And then there are these written submissions of, the, of what's going to be read to the court by the advocates who come before the court. Again, there are no questions during the, the argument by the advocates. But it's after the advocates have finished their argument, the uh, the president judge, the chief judge, then uh, surveys the court and asks if there are any questions. If there are members of the court who have questions, they then ask the question. And then the court adjourns. It provides a period of time, depending on the complexity of the question, a period of time for the advocates to leave the courtroom and to get instructions from their government. Recognize that these advocates are not just ordinary advocates. They're agents for their government. So they bind their government when they give answers. And many times, advocates will want some time to consult with their own government before they provide an answer to the court. So it's a, uh, it looks, uh, in many respects, like uh, a uh, oral argument before a large court, but it really is quite different in their procedure. The, a real important function of the International Court of Justice is the construction of treaties. And a good example of the dispute resolution uh, process and the impact that that process has had on human rights uh, re resolve, uh, is when we look at the disputes relating to Article 36 of the Vienna Convention of Constitutional consular rights, and a uh, treaty entered into 
1993. Article 36 says simply, authorities of a state arresting, charging, or detaining the national of another nation shall without delay inform the consular post of the nation whose citizen is involved. So there's a duty to involve, uh, inform the president, a person who's arrested or charged of their rights. And it's very likely that most people who are arrested in a foreign country have never heard of Article 36 of the, of the Consular Convention. Uh, but it is a right that was put into treaty form in large part because of the advocacy of the United States. The United States was insistent that nations that arrested their nationals who might be tourists in Turkey or some other land and might be arrested on uh, some charges, perhaps uh, for many uh, young tourists there was uh, drug charges, but they're now uh, in a land where they don't speak the language, they don't know uh, what, how the courts function, and it's extremely important uh, for people who are arrested in a foreign land uh, to have access to their consuls and through the consuls then uh, access to advice about uh, lawyers who might represent them and guidance about the uh, judicial system of the country. Now, the, there is an optional protocol uh, to this Vienna Convention and it says that disputes arising out of the interpretation or application of this treaty shall lie within the compulsory jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. So, if you sign and ratify the treaty and the optional protocol, you now are saying that the International Court of Justice has the authority to uh, resolve any disputes. And as we'll see, quite a number of these disputes have come up. Um, but let's begin with the overall jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice and look at the United States. In 1985, the United States withdraws from the general jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. And this follows an adverse uh, judgment against the United States in the case of Nicaragua versus the United States uh, in 1984. Now, the United States, in withdrawing uh, from the optional protocol and from the jurisdiction of, of the court itself, uh, said um, that it would, uh, it would no longer participate in the proceedings instituted against it by Nicaragua in the, in the ICJ. So even while Nicaragua case was going on, the United States refused to participate. Um, but then it went on to say, the United States went on to say, the objectives of the ICJ to which we subscribe, the peaceful adjudication of international disputes were being subverted by the effort of Nicaragua and the Cuba, Cuban and Soviet, Soviet sponsors to use the court as a political weapon. The Reagan administration was greatly offended by having to defend its action in Nic Nicaragua and therefore withdrew from the general jurisdiction, ICJ. But look, listen to what the United States continues to say. This action does not signify uh, uh, any lessening of our traditional commitment to international law and to the International Court of Justice in perform, performing proper functions. U.S. acceptance of the World Court's jurisdiction under Article 36 of its statute remains strong. We are committed to the proposition that the jurisdiction of the court com uh, comprises all cases which the parties refer to it and all matters that are appropriate to the court to handle pursuant to the United States, the United Nations Charter, or treaties and conventions that enforce. So the United States still potentially before the court under the optional protocol to the Vienna Convention. It's withdrawn from the general jurisdiction, but still uh, uh, the, uh, the ICJ has jurisdiction over disputes relating to the treaty, the Vienna Convention, because the United States is still signed on to the optional protocol. We now have three cases that I want to look at briefly. 
uh, in Paraguay versus United States was decided in 1998, and that uh, that decision by the World Court won against the United States. The United States uh, admitted that uh, there were prisoners, people who were uh, charged with crimes, specifically charged with capital crimes in the United States, who were never informed about their rights under Article 36. And uh, these nations, uh, in this case Paraguay, said you should not prosecute our uh, citizens in your country when you have not given them the benefit of Article 36. The United States lost the case. It admitted that the citizens of, of Paraguay had not been informed, apologized, and the United States uh, then offered uh, not only to make apologies but to try to make things right and to bring it, uh, its nation into compliance with Article 36. Following that, in 2001, there was a case style La Grande, or Germany versus the United States, brought before the World Court. It related uh, to uh, uh, two brothers, the La Grande brothers, who had been uh, charged in Arizona uh, for capital crimes. And uh, they were actually citizens of, of Germany. They had lived in the United States for a number of years. Uh, arresting officers indicated that they had no idea that they were foreign nationals. But there was a duty to inform foreign nationals of their rights under Article 36. This was not done. The United States loses again. So the United States now uh, has lost two cases before the World Court. There's then a third case uh, brought originally in 2004, the second round, of, second round of argument in 2009. But the third case was brought by Mexico and was brought on behalf of 52 Mexican citizens who had been charged with capital crimes in the United States. And uh, this, uh, this case now leads to the United States backing down from even its commitment uh, to allow the International Court of Justice to adjudicate disputes relating to Article 36. It's an interesting case in many respects because the United States had promised that it would take action. It made that promise following the, the case uh, uh, brought, brought originally by Paraguay and made a similar promise in the case after the case brought by Germany was resolved against the United States. So it had this litany of promises that it was going to take action. Uh, but we now get a case brought by Mexico involving 52 uh, citizens, and the United States loses the case. Um, and now the question is, what's the United States going to do to fulfill the promises it made following these earlier two cases? And what happened in the United States was, was that President Bush, who had been governor of Texas during an earlier time when the Texas courts and the Texas uh, executive had refused to follow the uh, decision of the world court, uh, President Bush, acting in a way different from Governor Bush, issue, issued an order it compelled state court compliance. It's the president of the United States saying the state courts must comply with the world court's decision in Avena. It asked the Supreme Court to dismiss a case uh, that was related to a, a, Texas, uh, a Texas case relating to a Mexican national. And it withdrew from the optional protocol. So the United States, having said back in 1984, that uh, it was going to adhere to the jurisdiction of the court where it was appropriate and made specific reference uh, to the usefulness of the court in resolving disputes relating to Article 36, now withdraws not from the general jurisdiction, which it had already done in 1984, but uh, now from the optional protocol. 
the case of Medellin versus Texas was resolved by the United States Supreme Court, and uh, that case held that the, um, that the president uh, was not within his constitutional authority when he directed the states to comply with the United States treaty obligation. And he decided that um, that state court, and it's decided that state courts uh, are not bound by the International Court of Justice to give effect to the decision in Mexico versus the United States. So as we look at the role of the world court in deciding human rights cases, I think we'll conclude that it's a fairly limited role. It's a, uh, it's a role that uh, does not permit individual complaints to be brought. So unlike the European Court of Human Rights, individuals do not get before the world court, only nations against nations. And we see the process through which nations submit to the jurisdiction of the court, including sometimes through treaties or protocols to treaties, and then the process through which the nations who are dissatisfied with the work of the International Court of Justice then withdraw from its jurisdiction. And so the United States is uh, a good example of bad world citizenship and dealing with human rights issues and the International Court of Justice.